as I mentioned, as we were looking at that scripture reading, I've there was one time when I was in the Navy and our ship was in a, a storm, but being in an aircraft carrier, you really didn't feel it. Just all the other ships getting tossed around. But reading through that text, I, I simply can't imagine uh, how that must have been. Uh, the experience of being on uh, uh, the Mediterranean and this ship being tossed about in such a way that they tried to, it was just about to fall apart. Uh, days and nights without even knowing whether it's day or night. And obviously you're not sleeping. And eating? No, you know. I mean, just a uh, just a horrible situation. The last verse we saw, he said, uh, "Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon the rocks, they're getting closer to this island. They cast out four anchors and wished for day." These brave sailors in the storm were being overwhelmed. In an effort to save the ship, they threw out anchors off the stern of the ship in order to slow its progress down as it was nearing its disaster. But the anchors proved ineffective against the storm and ultimately the ship was lost. But on this ship, a man that we've come to know and appreciate in his own writings, was a man by the name of Paul. He was different from the others. He was a child of God. He was a man on a mission. He was a man of faith, and he was a man who had fellowship with God. And they made him entirely different from everybody else who was on that ship. And his outlook was hence completely different. These sailors threw over these anchors in an attempt to steady the ship, but the anchors failed. As I read that text, though, I find that the Apostle Paul threw out some anchors. Not necessarily over the side in steadying the ship, but towards the hearts of those who were there to steady themselves during this storm. Even though the ship was battered and broken, the Apostle Paul was ready to stand steady and strong. I'd like to take an attempt to bring out four anchors that are found within this text that the Apostle Paul found himself clinging to and using and allow us to apply the same. The first is found in verse 23, and I'll refer to it as the anchor of the presence of God. For there stood by me that night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. I surely think Paul would have, according to everybody else's account, found himself uh, uh, by himself. But here the text says that he was not alone. The Lord himself came to minister and bring peace to his heart. You know, brethren, regardless of the storms of life that all of us have experienced and no doubt will, the Lord Jesus Christ is there. His presence is with us to grant us confidence, even as the Apostle Paul mentions here of himself. David writes in the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The presence of God all too often seems to escape us in the times of the greatest of difficulties. What an encouragement, though, it is to know that we will never face an instance in our life on our own. Never a tragedy, no trial, no storm of life will we ever face alone. The Lord Jesus Christ is there. Every valley, every step, every mountain will be graced by his presence. The blessed footmen that David talks about, his goodness and mercy to follow us all the way, every single step of the way, clinging to that during such a storm of life. What it would be to have such a blessing to have the manifest presence of the Lord as Paul had there on that ship. And yet what we have within the scriptures themselves, in those words and in the presence of, of the Lord that he assures us by his Holy Spirit that I am with you, I am there, is such a great joy. 
A pastor once told a story that when he was a boy growing up in a very crowded, busy city, that he thought of himself to be quite independent, but his mother arranged for a teenage girl to walk home with him to school and walk home again, and she paid him, the girl a little bit of money. Well, at his age, he was somewhat embarrassed and, and just tried to do all he can to distance himself from this situation. He went, aho went ahead and came to his mother one day and said, he says, Mom, he says, if you just give me a nickel, for every week, that'll save you money. And he says, I'll be better off. He says, I'll walk to school by myself, and I'll be extra careful, and you can keep the rest of the money for yourself. Well, he says, my mom thought for a while and pondered on it, and she says, okay. And to his great delight, for the rest of his time in school, he walked to school and walked back home again, never once having to pay have somebody else walk with him for his own safety and security. Well, after some time, as he grew up and his independence was being reminded to a family reunion, he started bragging about what had taken place years ago and his mother, after the story was finished, stood up and he says, do you think that I would have allowed you to go to school back and forth alone? He says, as you went to school, I was always there way behind, and I walked to school with you every day. And at 3.30 when you got out of school, I was waiting there, and I walked all the way back with you again. You know, we don't think about the presence of God. We don't think of, of him always watching over uh, his children. But the Apostle Paul in this most difficult a hardship, a tragic, a fearful situation says, God is there with me. Cast that anchor. Keep it with you. It is not a drag, but it is there as a matter of security within our own hearts and lives. Sometimes I weary when I hear people pray, Lord, be with me. I ask the question, where is he? Where has he gone if he's not with you? I think of the struggle of, of, uh, of the prophet up on Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal dancing all around and, and, and so forth and so on. And, and the prophet turns him and he says, maybe he's gone on vacation. You know, maybe he's uh, sleeping. Maybe he's bu busy about other things. He knew that Jehovah God was with him all the time. And so the anchor of God's presence is one that we would delight in and to know him constantly in our walk with him. The second anchor that the Apostle casts forth comes out of verses 24 and 25, and I'll refer to this as his promises, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that are with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. As the Apostle Paul weathered this long and terrible storm, the Lord came with his precious promises, provided unto him personally. He reminded Paul that he would indeed stand before Caesar, as was told him before. That was what would happen. And that those on the ship would be spared, for Paul, just having a word from God was enough to anchor him with that blessed assurance. Why? Why was that a sufficient thought to keep him from disaster? Because Paul knew that God's word was good. What he says, he means. He is indeed faithful to his word. Romans 4.21 says, And being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Being fully persuaded that what God said, he would perform. He was able to. His promise was secure. Paul knew the character of God. He understood these things. God's promises are based upon his word. It's pure. It's inspired. It will stand the test of times in the flames of that the world has tried to destroy. The psalmist says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The promises of God. 
Dr. Everett R. Stroms from Ontario spent a vast amount of time studying the promises of Scripture. In writing the Contact magazine, he said, quote, The Holy Scriptures contained a grand total of 8,810 promises. How do I know? He says, I've counted them. I do not guarantee my count is perfect, but it is the most accurate that I know of. And he broke those promises down, clarifying them and classifying them into eight different categories. He said two of the promises provided in Scripture are made from God the Father to God the Son. Two promises are made by the evil spirits. Nine promises are made by that old liar, the devil, and you think of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was in, tempted in the wilderness by him, and you think of the things that devil had promised him uh, that would actually never happen. Twenty-nine promises are made by angels, most of them found in the Gospel of Luke. Two hundred and ninety promises made from man to God. 991 instances of one person making a promise to another, and then 7,487 promises from God to man. 85% of the promises found within Scripture are God's promises, His Word, to people, to man. The Apostle Paul says, what God says, I believe. His word is good. His word is true. It is sure. I can bank on that. Dr. Storms additionally found out that Titus had no promises at all. Ephesians had only six. And Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel had over a thousand promises each. What a blessing those are. One of the memorable scenes in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress Christian is finding the pathway quite difficult, then he climbed over a stale to walk in the bypath meadow, and eventually he found himself in the grog and the mud and the slime, overgrown by poisonous vines. The sky became black and dark. Christian then spent the night huddled at the foot of an oak tree and caught by a downpour. And the next morning, giant despair falls upon dear Christian, captures him, beats him, imprisons him in the dungeon of Doubting Castle with its grim battlements, its thick walls. Christian tries to sing, but he can't. At length, his mood sinks deep. Giant despair continues to beat him mercilessly. He grows weaker each day. He finds himself in the cell with a rope, a knife, a bottle of poison, other tools for suicide. But in a moment that he's tempted to end his misery. But one evening, at midnight, he begins to pray. A little before day, good Christian finds that absolutely amazing. The text says, What a fool am I, thus to lie in the stinking dungeon when I may as well walk at liberty, I have the key in my bosom called promise. That will, I am sure, open any lock of Doubting Castle. And it did. The promise of God that was secure within Christian's life had been forgotten because the circumstances, the surroundings of life had beaten him down almost to the point of despair. Claim the promises of God as an anchor for your soul. You can sail through the storms of life. Grab a hold of the fact of the matter that he is present, but indeed that his promises will lock any chain on your soul. Verse 24, a third anchor provided is the anchor of the providence of God. Saying, fear not, Paul, Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all that sail with thee. The Apostle Paul is told by the Lord that the storm is a part of God's working out these things in Paul's life. At that moment in time, the storm was the safest place for the Apostle Paul 
to be in because he was in the will of God and God was working out this mighty way for the situation in his life do you know that God is doing the very same thing in our lives sometimes it is the storm of life that seems to be the thing that is opposing us when in fact it is indeed the simple faith bringing us through in the will of God for God indeed is a sovereign Lord Isaiah 45 7 I form the light and create the darkness I made peace and create evil I the Lord do all things he's in absolute control the storms or the times of peace James 1 17 every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning he indeed is the provider of all such things if I didn't know God was on the throne I would not want to live in a, another second within this world despair would have overcome me centuries ago for every single man I was thinking of the disciples in the ship as the Lord Jesus Christ is there sleeping away and they are all tossed about with great fears because of the storm that's going on around them but he sleeps because for him it is nothing at all he knows the best for me and he can take care of me all things indeed do work together for good to those who love him to those who are the called according to his purpose the best thing we can do when the storms of life come is to run to him for refuge cling to him as the storms of life pass by church history is replete with many of these wonderful examples Emperor Charles V was seeking to take the life assassinate John Brent's friend of Martin Luther when Brent's heard of this plot to take his life he grabbed a loaf of bread and quickly ducked into his neighbor's hayloft he spent 14 days in that hayloft just long enough for that loaf of bread to be gone but the Lord sent a chicken at the end of the 14 days and that chicken laid 14 eggs and he was able to exist on those eggs until the 15th day when the chicken decided not to lay any more eggs so Brent's decided that this was his time word had gotten out the soldiers had gone Brent's life was saved in a similar way John Craig who was arrested during the time of the Inquisition and on the eve of his execution he tried to escape in Italy and as he was making his way down the road in the countryside he had no food and a dog approached him and he was trying to escape out of this particular area and he was afraid the dog was going to give him away and he shooed the dog away and he continued on his journey and the dog followed him again finally he noticed that the dog had a sack in his mouth and then his utter persistence the dog continued and the man grabbed the sack and in it Craig found coins enough money to help him get out of the country God's provision in his providence Robert Bruce of Scotland was running away for his life fleeing from his persecutors ducked into a small cave and immediately a spider spun a web over the entrance to the cave as Bruce's pursuers fanned across the landscape not knowing where he was two of them approached the cave and looked and the man said obviously nobody's in there there's a spider web over the top of that cave entrance Bruce Bruce breathed the prayer which said oh God I thank thee that in the tiny bowels of a spider you can make a place for me as a shelter God's providence in providing unknown to us in the situations of life knowing that he can do such things the Apostle Paul received the great promise of God for himself aborting that ship the Lord told him that he would be taken care of and not only he but all of the men who were there some tried to get off but God's promises said that no they were to stay with the ship brethren 
We live in a day when men are abandoning ships at alarming rates. They're giving up on life. They have no idea, no concept of all of the blessings that God has for them. The ships of life are the churches all around and they are jumping like rats off of a sinking ship. But it is where the church, faithfully proclaiming the word of God, that life can be found anchored sure. The final anchor comes at a verse that we didn't read, but it's at the very last, verse 44. The apostle says, And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. The last anchor is the performance of God himself. Not only was God present, not only had he provided his promises, and in his providence, these things would be taken care of. But now, it's the fulfillment of these things. It's God's performance. What the Lord told Paul, and what Paul believed would come to pass, everyone would safely be on shore, and God kept his word. It occurred. It happened. God is well able to work it all out. He will get you through the storms of life and land you safely beyond it. It may seem at the moment that the boat is sinking, that the ship is falling apart, that life seems to despair for all. The storms will win. However, when the waves are settled down and the winds have ceased blowing, when the rains have abated and the storm clouds have moved aside to the horizons, you'll see that he has performed exactly what he has said. Corey Ten Boom said in this way, when Jesus takes your hand, he keeps you tight. When Jesus keeps you tight, he leads you through your whole life. When Jesus leads you through your whole life, he brings you safely home. I think the struggles that we have are that our plans and our thoughts and our designs run oftentimes in contrast with what God has already planned out. So we often struggle with these very same things. I'd like to remind you that our God is a strong and powerful God who can do all that he has said. The beautiful verse in Ephesians 3, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, he performs in such a fashion, in such a way. The fact of the matter is, he didn't save you to lose his grip on you during the storm. He saved you to take you home to glory, and that is just what he will do. Irrespective of what may seem to take place at the time, irrespective of the circumstances and the situations, God is there to provide such. Set your anchors this morning. Set all of them. Know that the presence of God is there with us. Know the promises that he's provided to, to meet the needs of life. Know likewise that in his providential care, he's oversaw all of the things to this very moment, and he will through all of history, and that's proven by the matter of his performance. I wouldn't want to lean upon anybody else. I wouldn't want to lean upon anything else. I think our brother Bill Leroy safely has secured his, his heart in that thing. I believe our sister Janet Hara has safely secured her heart in that. And obviously we say, well, there's concerns. What will happen to the family and all of this? Isn't this sad? But no, these aren't things that are just thrown haphazardly around. Um, we know what God has done and what he is doing. May we find ourselves casting those anchors during our entire life. Let's pray. Father, as you search our souls here this morning, we recognize that there are um, times in our days, sometimes lasting much longer than others, when we're in absolute despair. We, we don't know where we're going and what's taking place or why the situation is happening. We question you. We question your presence. We question your, your, your even caring about us. 
thinking that we know what is best for our lives. And yet, in the most heart of situations, the, the storms of life, when all seems to be lost, your presence is not only sought after, but is there. And your words have provided us with truths that we can cling to. And your providence has provided not only the situations of hardship that we're going through, but you will perform it even until the day of Jesus Christ. You will see us through. Thank you for such a security that is laid upon each of your children. Not one of them would be lost. Not one would be lost. Not one would be lost. Lord, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what will take place in our lives as individuals or as families or as a church or as a nation. But what we have is the security of our Savior and the promises of his presence with us throughout all eternity. Thank you, O Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.